lot about particle accelerators, so I'm not an expert in this area, but I would like to share my knowledge with all of you related to this. So the first question that comes to our mind is, what is particle accelerator? So as the name suggests, particle accelerator, it is a machine that is used to accelerate the charged particles to very high energies of the order of GeVs and TeVs. That is giga electron volt and para electron volt. So charged particle accelerators, they are used to accelerate electrons, protons, deuterons, and other heavy ion charged particles, for example, lithium, carbon, etc. So the next question that comes to our mind is, why do we need to accelerate the charged particles? So high energy charged particles, they can be used for a variety of research purposes. So one of the advantage of using particle accelerator is to study inside of the atom. So high, high energy charged particles, they are used to poke inside atoms. So now, why do we need high energy particles to study inside of the atom? So as we know, inside atom, there is positively charged nucleus. So it has neutrons and protons inside it. Neutrons, they are neutral, and protons, they are positively charged. And the positive charge of nucleus is because of the positive charge of protons. And there are electrons around it, which are negatively charged, right? So because of the Coulomb repulsive force, so electron cloud, which is negatively charged, would repel anything that is negatively charged. It repel, it, for example, it will repel other electrons, right? So physics, they require high energy particles to punch through the electron cloud so they can study inside of the atom. And beyond that, there comes a problem of resolution and that is associated with the wave nature of particles. So according to Dee Broglie, the particles, they behave like waves. So they have wavelength associated with them. And waves, they have tendency to spread, so waves cannot be localized. So that results into an issue of resolution. And that problem is again solved by using particle accelerators. So whenever you want to study something by shining light on that thing, the wavelength of that light has to be smaller than the wavelength of something that you want to study. And physicists, they want to study inside of the atoms. They want to study subatomic particles which have the wavelength associated with them. So they require high energy charged particles with wavelength that is smaller than the wavelength of subatomic particles. And this is achieved by using particle accelerators. So they use these accelerator machines to increase the energy of the particles, so as to increase the momentum of the particles, so as to decrease the wavelength of the particles. So according to Dee Broglie, so wavelength associated with particles is given by H over P, where H is the Planck's constant, and P is the momentum, linear momentum, lambda is the wavelength, so from here, lambda is inversely proportional to the momentum of the particles. So as the momentum of the particles increases, that results into a decrease in wavelength. So the physicists, they use high energy charged particles with smaller wavelength, that is smaller than the wavelength of the subatomic particles, in order to study uh, inside of the atom. And the, moreover, the energy of these charged particles, it is used to create the massive particles that physicists want to study. So charged particle accelerators, they increase the energy of particle, not only the energy, but also the mass, according to energy and mass equivalence relation given by Einstein. So mass is a form of energy. So these are a few of the applications of accelerators, but there are more than this, which we will talk about later in this talk. So next important question, how do we obtain these particles. Where do we get these particles from? So as we just discussed, so charged particles, the uh, charged particle accelerators, they accelerate electrons, they accelerate protons. So where do we get electrons from? Where do we get protons from? So electrons, they can be created by heating a filament or by heating, by heating metal. So by heating a metal, it causes electrons to be ejected from the surface of metal. And this mechanism is also used in cathode ray tubes. Cathode ray tube is also present in television. So this is a 
arrangement of cathode ray tube. So it consists of a glass tube. There is vacuum inside the glass tube. And here on the left, there is a filament. So that filament, when it is hot, it acts like an electron gun. So it splits out the electrons. And as you can see, this tube, potential difference is applied across the tube. So the left end is negative, and the right end is positive. And cathode is negatively charged, anode is positively charged. So cathode is electron emitter, anode is electron eater. So when this filament is hot, when cathode, it splits out the electrons, and the electrons, they are accelerated towards the anode, and they are collected at the node. So cathode ray tube is nothing but, it's an example of small charge particle accelerator. So that's how electrons are created by heating the filament. And then those can be accelerated by using accelerators. Now, where do we get protons from? So protons, they can be easily obtained by ionizing hydrogen atom. So what is inside hydrogen atom? How many protons? One, how many electrons? One. So hydrogen atom <coughs> has only one proton, and there is one proton in the nucleus, and there is electron around it. So what if we remove this electron from the hydrogen? So what is it left with? Proton, that's what we need. So protons, they can be obtained by the process of ionization. So it's a process of removing the electrons from the atom. And these can be accelerated by using particle accelerators. Okay. So there are two types of accelerators. One is called linear accelerators, and we also call these as LINAC, where L-I-N stands for linear, and A-C, it stands for accelerator. And another type is circular accelerators, which we also call as synchrotrons. So what is linear accelerator? So as the name suggests, in linear accelerators, charged particles, they follow a linear path. So they move in straight lines, as you can see in this picture. So linear accelerator, it ejects electrons like a bullet from the gun. So as you can see here in this figure, and they are used mainly to carry out experiments when the target is fixed. So they are used for fixed target system. And that you can see here, in this figure here, so this is accelerated charged particles, they are allowed to hit the fixed target. And in circular accelerators, as the name suggests, charged particles, they go around a circle. So every time they go around the circle, they get multiple kicks of energy. So that's how they get accelerated. And circular accelerators, they can be used for fixed target system as well as to perform experiments by colliding the two beams. So one beam, it goes clockwise. Another beam, it goes anti-clockwise. So colliding beam experiments can also be performed by using circular accelerators. And here, that is shown here. So there are two beams, high energy particles. They are going to collide with each other and all the energy is released due to this reaction. So there are advantages and disadvantages of both linear and synchrotrons over each other. So as we just discussed, circular, in circular accelerators, particles, they go around the circles, right, multiple times, and they get multiple peaks of energy each time they go around a circular path. And in synchrotrons, they can provide very high energy particles without having to be of tremendous, tremendous length. To like linear accelerators, they occupy a lot of space, whereas cyclotrons, they are smaller in size. Um, circular accelerators, they are smaller in size in comparison to linear. So one of the disadvantage of using circular accelerators is that, as we just discussed, they can be used to perform colliding beam experiments, where one beam goes clockwise, one beam it goes anti-clockwise. So there are many chances for collisions to happen at the places where the particle beams are made to cross each other. So because of the collisions, they radiate electromagnetic radiations. For example, gamma photons. And photons is nothing but it's a quantum of light. So circular accelerators, they emit light, and that is why we are called synchrotron as well. So the word synchrotron, it means flashes of light. 
and then linear accelerators, they are easier to build. Why? Because charged particles, they travel along a straight line, so they are easier to build in comparison to circular accelerators, and linear accelerators, they do not require large magnets. So circular, uh, circular accelerators, they require large magnets, so as to force the charged particles to go along a circular path. So these are not required for linear. And moreover, circular accelerators, they also need large radius in order uh, for the particles to get high enough energies. And circular accelerators, they are more expensive to build in comparison to linear accelerators. So these are a few of the advantages and these advantages of linear and synchrotrons. So which one would you like to buy, linear or circular? These are very, very expensive, right? millions of dollars. Okay. So now let's move on to a very, very important question. How does a particle accelerator work? So how does it accelerate the charged particles? So it's very simple. So working of particle accelerators it is based on this basic law of physics. It's based on Coulomb's law, Newton's law, idea of electric field, and the concept of magnetic field. So as you know, if two light charges, for example, positive charge, and another positive charge, if they are sitting at some distance r apart, they experience repulsive force due to each other. And if they are unlike charges, they experience attractive force due to each other. So charged particles, they experience force due to the presence of other charged particles nearby. And this force, it causes acceleration, according to Newton's second law of motion. So when charged particles they experience force, it causes acceleration. So that's how charged particles can be accelerated. So here I'm saying, if this charge is present here, so another charged particle is present here, at some distance r apart, so they experience force due to each other. But now the question is, how does this charged particle knows there is another charge sitting nearby? Then how does this know there is another charge sitting nearby? So this is something you think about, right? And the answer, it lies in the concept of electric field. Now what is electric field? So electric field is nothing but it's a space around the charge okay, under which its influence can be experienced by some other charge. For example, if some charge is present in electric field of this charge, it will experience force because of this charge. It's because of the space around the charge under which its influence can be experienced by other charged particles. Okay? And the relation between electric force and electric field is given by this equation. So electric field is always away from positive charge and towards the negative charge. So the direction is, so we are in the electric field vectors, is away from positive and towards the negative charge. So from this relation, if the charged particle is positively charged, it will experience force in the same direction as that of the electric field, same as the direction of electric field. If it is negatively charged, it will experience force in a direction opposite to the direction of electric field. So charged particles experience force due to the presence of electric field, and when they experience force, they get accelerated. So now you have an idea how charged particles, they get accelerated, but charged particles, they are directed and focused by using magnetic field. Now what is magnetic field? So magnetic field is nothing but a space around a magnet, for example, let's say this is a magnet, a dipole, so under which its influence can be experienced by other magnetic materials. Okay? And charged particles they experience force in the presence of magnetic field as well. So here, and that is given by force experienced by charged particles due to magnetic field is given by Q V cross B. So when Q is the charge, V is the velocity, and B is the magnetic field strength. Okay? So now let's say magnetic field is applied by using magnets. Let's say it is uniform magnetic field. Uniform magnetic field means the strength of magnetic field is same everywhere. Okay? 
So now let's say charged particle is present here inside the magnetic field which is at rest. So what is the force experienced by a charged particle if it is not moving? What do you think? Zero, it will not experience any force because V is zero, it's not moving at all. So what about the force experienced by charged particle if it is moving parallel to the direction of magnetic field? So this expression, I can rewrite this as, let's say the magnitude of force is given by, let's solve the vector product, Q, V, V, sine theta, where theta is the angle between V and V. So what is the force experienced by this charged particle if it moves parallel to the magnetic field? Zero, because angle is zero, it will not experience any force. Now let's say this charged particle is moving at some angle with the direction of magnetic field, now it will experience force due to the magnetic field. Right? So at what angle do you think it will experience the maximum force? It has to be 90, right? Sine 90 is 1, that is the maximum value of sine theta. So the maximum force experienced by charged particle is when it moves perpendicular to the direction of magnetic field and it experiences force that is towards the center of the circle. And we call this as centripetal force. So when it is moving perpendicular to magnetic field, it experiences force that is centripetal force. And centripetal force, it causes the particle, the charged particle to go around the circular path at every point it gets towards the center of the circle. And the magnitude of centripetal force is given by mv squared over r, where m is the mass, v is the again the speed, and r is the radius of this circular path. So if it is moving perpendicularly, then we can equate these two equations. Right? So from here, Q, V, V must be equal to MV squared over R. Right? So we can now find a relation between V and R from here. So one will cancel out. So from here, Q, V over M is equal to Q, V over M is equal to V over R. So R will go to this side. So here, if Q is constant, charge is constant, magnetic field is uniform, means V is constant, mass is also constant. So from here, V is directly proportional to R. So what does it mean? So velocity of charged particle is directly proportional to the radius of the circular path. It means as the charged particles, they get accelerated, they gain energy, they gain speed. So the path of the, the uh, circular path, radius, it also increases. As they get energy, the, uh, the circular uh, track radius, it also increases with the increasing energy. So now you know how charged particles they get accelerated in the presence of electric field and how they get focused and steered and directed by using magnetic field. The magnetic field forces them to move along a circular track. So magnetic field is also used to focus the beam. Like if you want to focus the beam at a particular location, that is at a particular point, that is done by using magnetic field. Then for that purpose, quadruple magnets are used. So that looks like this, it's north, south, so it's a quadruple magnet. So quadruple magnet, it acts like a lens. So it focuses the beam at a particular point where you want it to be. So electric and magnetic field are used to, for this purpose. And then charged particles, they are allowed to travel through the beam lines or beam pipes. These are metal beam pipes. And there is, uh, there is very high vacuum inside the beam lines. So charged particles, they travel through vacuum. So now why vacuum is important? So what would, what would go wrong if there is air inside the beam lines? There's other particles in there. If there are particles, it will interact with like dust particles that may spread, the charged particles, they may lose energy, right? So vacuum is very, very important. And in these particle accelerators, vacuum is maintained by using ultra high vacuum pumps. It is maintained like 24-7. Okay, so now you have an idea of how particle accelerator work. So this figure, it shows you aerial view of LHC, that is Large Hadron Collider. So this is the most powerful, the largest particle accelerator in the world, and it is in Switzerland. So it is a synchrotron, as you can see. So this ring is 27 kilometers in circumference and it is all 
this facility is all underground, so as to protect from the radiation damage. Okay, I want to show you a video on this. And this, uh, this facility, it has collaboration with over 10,000 scientists all from all over the countries, from hundreds of universities and labs. So I would like to show you a video on this, how does it work. Though this bottle of compressed hydrogen gas looks, it marks the beginning of the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator chain, culminating in CERN's spectacular Large Hadron Collider. Hydrogen atoms from this gas cylinder are fed at a precisely controlled rate into the source chamber of a linear accelerator, CERN's LINAC-2, where their electrons are stripped off to leave hydrogen nuclei. These are protons and have a positive charge, enabling them to be accelerated by an electric field. Their journey to eventually take part in ultra-high energy collisions, similar to those following the Big Bang, can now begin. This initial acceleration has caused Lina 2 to be likened to the numbering first stage of a huge rocket. By the time this packet of protons leaves Lina 2, it will be travelling at one-third the speed of light. It's about to enter the booster, stage two of the rocket, if you will. In order to maximize the intensity of the beam, the packet is divided up into four, one for each of the booster's rings. So pulsed, in the same way that you push a child on a swing each time they reach a certain point. Magnets exert a force on the passing protons at right angles to their direction of motion, and so powerful electromagnets are used to bend the beam of protons round the circle. The booster accelerates the protons up to 91.6% of the speed of light and squeezes them closer together. Recombining the packet from the four rings, it's then flung on into the proton synchrotron, by analogy, stage three of our rocket. Let's just follow two such proton packets. The proton synchrotron is 628 meters in circumference and they circulate for 1.2 seconds reaching over 99.9% .9 of the velocity of light. It's here that the point of transition is reached, a point where the energy added to the protons by the pulsating electric field cannot translate into increase of velocity as they are already approaching the limiting speed of light. Instead, the added energy manifests itself as increasing mass of the protons. In short, the protons can't go faster so they get heavier. The microscopic kinetic energy of each proton is measured in units called electron volts, and now the energy of each proton has risen to 25 giga electron volts, or GEV. The protons are now 25 times heavier than they are at rest. The packets of protons are now channeled into stage 4, the superproton synchrotron, a huge ring 7 kilometers in circumference designed specifically to accept protons at this energy and increase it to 450 GeV. Soon, the packets of protons will be energised sufficiently to be launched into the orbit of the gigantic Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, which lies between the Jura Mountains and the Alps and straddles both France and Switzerland. Lying deep underground, it has a circumference of 27 kilometres. There are two vacuum pipes within the LHC containing proton beams travelling in opposite directions. Using ultra-sophisticated kickers to synchronise incoming packets with those already circulating, one vacuum pipe has injected into it protons which will circulate clockwise and the other protons which will circulate anti-clockwise. The counter-rotating beams cross over in the four detector caverns where they can be made to collide. The energy of the collision is double that of the individual opposing protons, and it's the debris from these collisions that is trapped in the detectors. For half an hour, the SPS injects protons. Finally, there are 2,808 packets. During this time, the LHC adds extra energy to each proton, whose velocity is now so near the speed of light 
that it goes round the 27km ring over 11,000 times each second, getting a boost of energy at each revolution from the pulsed electric field. Finally, each proton has an energy of 7 tera electron volts, and they're 7,000 times heavier than at rest. The magnetic force needed to keep the beams bending to the ring is so enormous that nearly 12,000 amps must flow through its electromagnets. This is achieved by making the LHC colder than outer space, so that its magnets become superconducting. Now the protons are ready to collide in the detectors. The steering magnet finally brings them onto a collision course. The total energy of two protons colliding in the LHC is 14 tera electron volts and reproduces similar states to moments after the Big Bang. Particle traps from these collisions will be analysed by computers connected to the detectors, and it's hoped these tracks will give a new insight into the very birth of our universe. How our universe has evolved, what governs its behaviour today, and where it's going in the future. Magnets. And then it consists of two uh, conductors, 
And these conductors we also call these as Bs because the shape of conductor it matches with the shape of letter B. And oscillating potential is applied across the conductors. So these are the two conductors and there is a gap in between these. So oscillating voltage is applied across these conductors. It says, uh, we say it as oscillating potential because potential it changes the polarity after every fixed interval of time so as to accelerate the charged particles. And the proton source is placed here in the gap. Okay, so now let's say in the beginning this is the situation. Let's say this is positively charged, this is negative charge here. So the protons, they are positively charged, they will be repelled by positive voltage and they will be attracted towards negative. So protons, they follow a circular path and they reach here. Again, you can see proton charged particles, they are allowed to move perpendicular to the direction of magnetic field. And the magnetic field, it bends the beam into a circular path. So as soon as proton reaches the other side of conductor, then polarity reverses. Now this becomes positive and this becomes negative. Now these protons will be repelled by positive and they will be attracted to negative. So the protons, they get accelerated towards the other end. So as soon as they reach here, polarity again reverses. So the protons, they follow a circular path and as they get accelerated, they gain energy and the radius increases. And on this relation, V is directly proportional to R. And then the protons, which is here, and they exit here. And then these high energy protons, they are used to carry out different research experiments and they are also used in medical facilities. And cyclotron accelerator, it can accelerate the particles up to 100 MeVs. That is MeVs mega electron volt, that is generated to power 6 mega electron volt. And the first cyclotron, it was designed by Lawrence, and this is a real picture of cyclotron. What about circular accelerators? Now let's talk about linear accelerators or linear. So again, the parts of linear accelerator, they are very similar, the one for the circular accelerators. The main difference is, yeah, the particles, they go, go around circular track, so we do not require large magnets, so as to bend the beam in circular track. So this is the layout of linear accelerator. There are different types of linear accelerators, but we are not going to talk all, uh, we are not going to talk all of them. We are just going to talk about one type of linear accelerator, that we call as tandem accelerator. Tandem linear accelerator or just tandem accelerator. So here is the layout. So the first part is the ion source to produce the ions that you want to accelerate. And ion source, it produces negative ions. And then there is a tank. So this end of the tank we call this as low energy end, this is high energy end, and there is Wendy graph generator inside the tank and that generator is used to generate very high voltage. So depending on the size of Van de Graaff generator, it can generate voltage up to 20 megavolts, so which is very, very high voltage. And the center of this tank, we call this as high voltage terminal. So negative ions, they are accelerated towards the positive voltage at the center. So when negative ions reach the terminal, there are stripping foils and the carbon is used as a stripping foil. So carbon, it now removes the electrons from the negative ions. Now the negative ions changes to positive ions at the center. So now there is very high positive voltage at the terminal and the ions are now positively charged. So they get accelerated again because positive, positive, there is a repulsion. So the positive ion beam will get accelerated towards the high energy end of the tank. So this is called tandem accelerator. The word tandem means twice, means voltage is used twice to accelerate the charged particles. So charged particles, they get accelerated once as negative ions and then as positive ions. So when the charged particles they reach the high end or high energy end of this tank, then there are quadrupole magnets on the way, which is not shown here in the picture. So quadrupole magnets, they are used to focus the beam on the bending magnet. Okay. So it's called bending magnet because it bends the beam along the circular track. Again, you can see charged particles, they move perpendicular to the magnetic field. So this beam, it bends the beam into a circular path and the beam reaches here. So then there is a 
fixed target that is uh, placed at the end of each uh, this beam line. So when beam is the target, the reaction happens and again particles come out. Based on the particles, different detectors are used around the, the target so as to detect those detectors. They are attached with the electronics and computer systems to analyze the data. So here in this figure, you see 4.5 MV tandem linear accelerator at Ohio University, Athens, Ohio, and it's uh, Edwards Accelerator Lab. And I performed my research experiments at this facility, and I helped with a number of experiments, like with the colleagues, and there are the people who come from outside who have, I helped other like outside users with their experiments. So this is the tank that I was talking about in the previous layout, and the ion source is behind this tank. So this is high energy area, and behind that, this portion is low energy area, and the ion source is placed here. And then there is a bending element placed here, which is not shown in this picture. So here is the lab layout of this facility in Athens. So this facility is equipped with two ion sources. So one is the cesium sputter source, and another is the duroplasmatron source. This we also call it helium source. So the cesium sputter source, it is used for proton beam, neutron beam, lithium, carbon, etc. And helium beam, also helium sputter source, it is used mainly or only for helium beam, as the name suggests. And these ion sources, they produce negative ions. And then there are inflection magnets placed in front of these ions or ion, these sources. So inflection magnet, it is used to deflect the beam. So magnet it deflects the beam, there is angel lens placed in front of the beam. So angel lens is used to focus the beam on low energy end of this tank. So this is the orange tank that is shown here in this figure. So the negative ions, when they are focused at, uh, at this low energy end of this tank, there is high voltage at the terminal in the center. So the negative ions, they get accelerated towards the terminal and they strip off their electrons by the carbon foils. For some experiments, gas stripping is also used. For that purpose, nitrogen gas is used to remove the electrons from negative ones. Okay, one of these two stripping methods are used uh, depending on the experiment. So negative ones, they lose their electrons. Now this positive ion beam, the positive beam now again, it feels repulsion because of the positive voltage at the terminal. So the positive, uh, positive uh, charged beam now is accelerated towards the high energy end this tank. So when the beam reaches here, so there is this red thing here is quadrupole magnet. So quadrupole magnet, it focuses the beam to the bending magnet. So here is a bending magnet. So bending magnet, it bends the beam in circular track to this direction. This bending magnet is also known as analyzing magnet. It not only does the bending of beam, but it also analyzes the charged particles. It selects the desired charged particles based on their energies and charge. The white thing that you see here, these are slits. So here, slits are shown here in this picture that are in plain way. So these slits, uh, these can be like opened, and you can close this based on it, uh, slits. They define the thickness of the beam, like how much beam you want. And then there is another set of quadrupole magnet here. Then the beam is now focused to the switching magnet. So this is called switching magnet because it switched the beam in five different beam pipes or beam lines. So these are metal beam lines. So two of them, they are in small target area, and three of them, they are in large target area. And there is one more beam line that we call as swinger beam line. So this is the sixth one. So as you can see here, so this beam line, so the beam, it goes along this path. So it goes like this, and the end of beam lines, uh, targets are placed. So target is placed here, for example, if the experiment is being performed on this beam line. And this finger beam line, it has very important feature. For example, if you want to, you have data at different angles, so you don't have to place detectors at all different angles. So you can actually rotate the beam at different angles. So you can keep your detectors fixed at one position, and you can rotate the beam. So the swinger can swing from 0 to 180. <coughs> Then there is a 30 meter long tunnel here, which is not shown in this picture, so detectors are placed here, so as to reduce the background. 
So there is very small hole, uh, hole in that uh, uh, tunnel, so the particles pass through so as to eliminate the background data. So this tunnel is closed with like concrete, very thick concrete doors, so as to eliminate the background in the data. And these five beam lines, all beam lines, they are designed for a special type of experiments. So swinger beam line, it is used mainly for gamma rays and neutrons. And then this 30L, so these are called like 30, 50. So these numbers are uh, according to the angles at which these are placed. And L is left, R is right. So 30 degree left beam line is mainly used for gamma rays. Then 15 degree left beam line is used to carry out rather four elastic spectrum experiment so as to find out the composition of any given sample. And then this uh, 20 degree, 23 degree right and 45 degree right beam lines, they are used for, to carry out experiments related to solid state physics or condensed matter physics. And 65 degree right beam line, it is specially designed for charge particle measurements. And this is the one that I use to perform my research experiments. Actually, there is a lot more going on from here to there. So there is a, there's another special feature that is available at this facility is pulsing and bunching. So for some experiments, continuous beam is required. But for some experiments, pulsed beam is required. For example, for my research experiments, I require the beam in the form of pulses. So there is a chopper here in low energy area that can actually chop the beam. And you can also adjust the gap between the two pulses. So for my experiment, it was like 200 nanoseconds. The beam was coming after every 200 nanoseconds, and it would last only for a few nanoseconds. So based on the experiments, uh, sometimes continuous beam is required, and sometimes pulse beam is required. And the thing that you see here with brown cap, these are gate walls. So as we discussed, so vacuum is very, very important to maintain inside the beam pipes. So for example, if uh, the experiment requires uh, that you want to change, make changes in this portion of the lab, then you can do that without disturbing the vacuum in the other portion of the lab, on the beam pipes. So these are gate walls, so you can close the gate walls, so there will be vacuum in the other portion, uh, rest of the facility. So without disturbing the vacuum. So there are gate walls everywhere. So you can't vacuum. Okay, so just to give you an idea, this is how 65 degree right beam left looks like. So beam is coming from behind the wall. So here, this is 65 degree right. So beam is coming from here behind the wall. So here. So this beam line is 3 meters long, and this is a target chamber that is placed at the end of beam line. So this beam line is specially used for charge particle measurements. And targets, they are placed at the center of the target chamber and they are placed on a target ladder that looks like this. So this target ladder you can hold up to six to seven targets at a, at a time, so we don't have to open the target chamber at any time if you want to change the target. And this target ladder, it can be rotated from zero degree to 360 degree, it can be lowered up and down. So this target ladder actually is calibrated before we perform the experiments so that we don't have to open the lid every time. Otherwise, it will disturb the vacuum. Again, it will take a few hours to bring back the vacuum. So just to give you an idea, this is how this charge particle detector looks like. So this is a silicon detector, again for different particles, different detectors are used. So this is a charge particle detector. So I will skip on this part, because we are running out of time here, but I want to show you one picture, one video on the accelerator lab. That will give you an idea how it looks like inside the lab.
which uh, Dr. Bruni focuses on, and one line for charged particles. This is another of our target areas. In this room, we have a facility for using nuclear techniques, studying what we call solid state or condensed matter physics. That's this large apparatus over there. Uh, Dr. Ingram leads the research which uh, uses that facility. We also have two other beam lights. There's one in the center, and this one is used largely by people who come from other universities and federal labs to collaborate with us on experiments. They can bring their equipment and send them here. One of the more important things we've done here is to make some very precise measurements of neutron proton scattering, which have relevance in cancer therapy. This is our last experimental area. We can use the beam, which is produced by the accelerator, to steer it into this assembly right here, which is a so-called reaction chamber, and then we measure the particles that are produced when the beam coming from the accelerator strikes the foil. We measure the products in these beam pipes, uh, as you see here. And this has, when it's fully assembled, 10 such pipes, so we can look at 10 directions.